is the sequel to last week's 1945 to 1960 Abroad. Now we are at home. Um, not as much warfare, but certainly a whole bunch of strife, as you can see just from the juxtaposition of these two pictures I put here at the beginning. So this week we're going to be going over the baby boom, the suburbs, which will be your other assignment as well, consumerism, what the end of the Truman and Eisenhower presidencies looked like, and then we are going to get started on race relations and segregation and all of that stuff. Um, we'll start it this week. It'll be your big project next week, and we will kind of wrap it up, quote unquote, next week. So this is sort of a passing the torch between the 1930s and the 1960s here. So away we go. We've talked about the baby boom before. We talked about it a little bit when we did Social Security in uh, the 1930s under Roosevelt, and we talked about how the baby boom is going to abet Social Security for a long, long time. Unfortunately, I don't have a whiteboard here with me, but hopefully you remember what I drew in class. Um, the baby boom is going to result in 50 million plus babies being born in the half decade following the end of World War II. So roughly 1945 to 1950 is gonna be that first big push but as you can see on the chart I have here at the bottom of the screen, the baby boom is really going to go up until the early 1960s. So it's roughly contiguous with the timeline that we're dealing with here. So if you imagine everything that we talk about in this chapter, um, it all is going to be taking place during the baby boom. Um, the baby boom is going to have a lot of kind of knock-on effects of a bunch of other things as we go forward. So just keep that in your mind as we go. The baby boom is seen as indicative of kind of two things. One, there is a faith in the economy. Uh, birth rates, as you can see here, were very, very, very low um, in the last years of the 1930s up into World War II. During World War II, that makes sense. A lot of husbands are away at war. But during the late 1930s is there is not that faith in the economy that says, hey, it's financially viable for us to plan to have a kid. Whereas after the war, it's very financially doable to have a kid or in the case of the baby boom, multiple kids. The size of families is going to grow in the baby boom rather largely. But once the war is over, the faith that America is going to keep getting better and that the economy is going to boom again is really going to spike. And as we can see here, uh, by 1947, it gets really big. It stays low for the beginning of the Korean War, which we talked about last week. And then once Eisenhower is elected, it's going to skyrocket because we won't be in a direct war with anybody. The Cold War is still going on, and we'll talk about that later in this chapter. But there is not a shooting war going on. Um, women are going to leave the workforce, as we talked about a little bit last time and the time before, and take on the role of homemaker in the 1950s. That's sort of your, your Betty Crocker archetype of, you know, doing all sorts of chores all day long, raising a, a gaggle of kids and having a steak ready when her husband comes home um, from work at 5.30 along with a drink. Um, by the time we get to the 1960s, a third of those women who were homemakers will be working, um, which absolutely makes sense because as we think about this if you're having a kid in this area here that kid is going to be in school by the time they're over here and you need additional income so that is going to be one of the things that is going to drive women to leave the house and take on um, a job for themselves is providing money for those larger families that are coming out as a result of the baby boom this is the first knock-on effect we talk about this is going to spur the economy forward the more kids you have, you need more homes, you need more space for people. So no longer is that, you know, one and a half bedroom apartment in the city going to do it for you anymore. You need to go get a house. You need to buy baby supplies. You need to buy toys for those kids. You need to buy clothes for all of those kids as they get older. This in turn spurs the economy, creates more jobs. And by doing that, more people have money to have a family. It's a self-perpetuating cycle here. Um, the economy is going to boom after the war. By the time we get into the Eisenhower presidency and the Korean War has ended, it's going to grow 37% in the 1950s, which is absolutely bonkers. I will show you a graph for that in one second. Um, like I said, having children is more financially viable, and this population explosion is what is going to fund Social Security for years to come, helped along by Dwight Eisenhower, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So this is just to illustrate 
how the economy is going to grow over the next years um, as people get into it, as families grow, um, you know, consumerism is going to take off. I would like to point out here that the average income for white families is going to rise a heck of a lot more than a similar trend, but lower down for African Americans and Hispanic people. Um, that is going to be sort of clear as to why that is in a little bit, but I did want to show you that that white families are going to benefit from the economics of the baby boom and everything else in the 1950s way more than minorities will. So we said that living in those cities where people had long lived um, isn't really doable for big families anymore. So what middle class American families are going to do is they're going to depart what are starting to be referred to as blighted inner cities, which is, you know, hey, these buildings are old, they're sort of falling apart, they haven't been repaired very well. You know, this neighborhood's going downhill, all that sort of stuff. There's not a ton of evidence that neighborhoods actually went quote unquote downhill. It's more of a way to, for white people to explain why they left communities that they'd been in for generations, and also a way to denigrate the African Americans that are moving in there at the same time. Um, so these inner cities basically have a giant population vacuum all of a sudden where the, you know, the apartments where people lived are now vacant and they need to be filled. They will be filled up with minorities that, as we saw, are not making as much money as the white people that can afford to live, move out to the suburbs. Um, the suburbs are going to be pre-planned communities on the outskirts of cities. Really before the 1940s, you don't really have suburbs. You sort of have city and then hinterland with, you know, a couple houses here and there on a couple acres, and then farmland right after that. The suburbs are going to fill in that hinterland area. So you are going to have houses with yards, all of that. I don't have pictures of that because that, like I said earlier, is one of the things you guys are going to be working on for your other assignment this week. The suburbs are seen as safe and affordable thanks to ready GI Bill money. Um, and also that money allows people to buy cars. So now the breadwinner for the family, the husband, is able to afford a car, live in the suburbs, and commute into the city to their office to work throughout the day, and then bring back money. The first big example of this is Levittown, New York. Um, it is the first major pre-planned community, and it is going to be almost exclusively white because, and we've talked about this before, they're going to employ what are called restrictive covenants, which basically say, hey, here's a contract you have to sign to move in to this suburb, and if you move in here, you cannot sell your house to somebody without basically the homeowners association signing off on it, which is a sneaky and later on found to be kind of a legal way um, to keep African Americans and other minorities out because they would not allow you to sell your house. So that's what a restrictive covenant is. It says you buy this house, white person, you can only sell it to another white person. Um, and much of America is going to follow the people of Levittown out to the suburbs and also employ those restrictive covenants all around the country. The Sun Belt is another area where we're gonna see a pretty large population boom. That is sort of the middle south, we're talking like Kentucky, Tennessee, places like that, where it used to be too hot to live. You're also gonna see this in a number of southern cities. So we're talking like Baton Rouge, Louisiana, um, Mobile, Alabama, places like that. And people are going to move there for two reasons. One, it's nice weather all year round, so you can get supplies in and out pretty easily. Um, so you can get people to work in factories longer. Most um, major military manufacturers are going to move to the south. And also, air conditioning, for real. It used to be too hot and too muggy down there for people to want to live long stretches of time. But if you can get air conditioning, all of a sudden that new technology that's been invented, it makes living in the South way more amenable to more people. And a number of factory workers and factory working families are going to leave those crowded, quote unquote, Northern cities that are blighted, so to speak, and they're going to move into the Middle South to work. Um, this sort of baby boom life in the suburbs thing is not only for white collar workers. So this is not only for people that are making money in you know accounting or advertising or engineering or stuff like that it's also available to blue collar labor workers and this is because and this is something you need to know here harry truman helps pass the taft hartley act and this is a follow-up to what we've seen under franklin roosevelt and this is going to allow after world war ii increased unionization everywhere 
So it allows for basically unions to work in any industry and the government can't shut them down. Um, the big one that's going to arise is the AFL, which is the American Federation, Federation of Labor, and the CIO, which is the Congress of Industrialized Workers, I thought, so I don't remember what O stands for. But these are the two big unions and they're going to mush together. If you watched um, The Irishman on Netflix, um, a large portion of that movie deals with the AFL-CIO. Um, that's gonna come together in 1955. Unions are coming out of World War II with a lot more leverage in working for uh, manufacturing businesses, and the Taft-Hartley Act is only going to make that better. American union membership, as we talked about during World War II, was on the rise. It is going to continue to rise after the war, and this is going to allow, that should say, better pay for labor. Um, I'll fix that later. Um, but it will allow for that, and as a result, um, people that previously would have been low-wage workers are going to be able to kind of work their way into the American middle class, be able to buy a family in the suburbs, and um, still be a blue-collar worker. As a result, these inner cities are sort of left to rot. Um, only the poor, which are largely minority populations, are going to stay because they can't afford to go anywhere else, or they're not allowed to go anywhere else like those restrictive covenants we just talked about. Um, slums are going to develop as those parts of the cities continue to rot. Um, also, something called eminent domain will be used where the cities basically say, hey, we need to use this land for something else. We will buy it out from you for cheap and you have to take it. And then they tear down all of this stuff. Um, there's a massive book that I am happy to loan you called The Power Broker by Robert Caro that deals with this in excruciating detail. But this is what's going to happen kind of around the country is slums are going to develop um, the once vibrant um, economics of um, these inner cities are going to be sort of left to rot. The cities aren't going to particularly look after them. The state government and the federal government aren't really going to look after them either. And it's not going to be until the 1980s, 1990s, when we get around to something called urban renewal, that we will see people wanting to move back into cities as opposed to get out of cities. Um, those vacancies left by the white families that are leaving um, are going to be filled largely by African Americans and Hispanics. Um, the African Americans are going to come from the South in the what is the last wave of the Great Migration. We've talked about this really since the 19 teens, 1920s, but African Americans are leaving the South. They don't want to be sharecroppers anymore. There are opportunities, albeit not great ones for them, in the North. So cities like Chicago, Detroit, New York, and then out West, like Los Angeles, are going to see a large influx of African Americans as they depart the rural South for greener, slightly less racist pastures. Okay, so we are going to keep rolling here into consumerism. That is a lot to look at. I don't know of a better way to explain consumerism than that's a lot to look at. That image right there is consumerism in a nutshell. When you consume, you buy. You have money to spend and you're going to go buy stuff. You're gonna get yourself a boat or a pool or a riding lawnmower golf clubs, you're going to go buy Wheaties, you're going to go fishing, you're going to buy a Coleman thing, you're going to buy a Schwinn bike, you're going to have what is apparently a Royal Chef grill. All this stuff has brands on it. That's what consumerism is. As Americans make more money, they are going to spend that money more and more. So the U.S. economy post-World War II is going to shift away from manufacturing um, for war. They're still going to keep doing that. Remember, they're still spending 20% of the gross domestic product minimum on defense stuff, but everything else is going to be geared more towards what you would call like family-oriented manufacturing. You're gonna buy cars, you're going to buy suburban accessories, which is what we're looking for here. Um, prior to all of this, you know, maybe you own one or two of these things if you live in the city. Maybe you own a golf club and you go out golfing or you play tennis every once in a while or maybe you know your kid has a bike, but consumerism is going to allow all of that to be in your life at all times. Look at this lady, so excited. She's getting a blender and she's got you know an electric kettle right here and a crock pot. It's exciting, it's exciting. But suburban accessories, as you go out and you buy your house, you're going to decorate it with a conspicuous show of your wealth. This is the stuff I have, look at it. And that is going to lead to a big term I want you all to know. And that is called keeping up with the Joneses. 
Jones is one of your kind of default American names. The Joneses were not a specific family, but the idea was is that, hey, I live in this suburb in a house that looks similar to the house next to me and the house next to that and the house across the street and the house the next block down. What can I do to differentiate myself? I'm gonna go out and buy the newest thing. I'm gonna go buy that blender. I'm gonna go buy a new motor for my boat. Um, and then your neighbors see that and they say, ooh, I wanna do that too. And think of when you were little and some sort of fad came out, like fidget spinners. Now imagine fidget spinners for adults and how you all needed one. It's the same thing with keeping up with the Joneses. They have that, I want it. I'm gonna go spend money to do that. And people now have, and I'm gonna talk about it again down here, what is called disposable income. They have money that does not directly need to go towards paying off a mortgage or bills or education, stuff like that. There is money to be spent and this is what is going to drive that American economy all through the late 40s, early 50s, into the 60s, is this idea of keeping up with the Joneses. Just to give you an idea of what people are buying here, this is a truncated list to say the least. Washing machines, lawn mowers, portable radios, um, portable record players, garbage disposals, Tupperware, credit cards become a thing, Barbie, hula hoops, Mr. Potato Head, outboard boaters for your boat that are affordable, televisions. All of this is going to be part of keeping up with the Joneses. Oh, you know, I went over to Bill and Mary Lou's last night and they had a new color television. Jerry, we need to buy one. That is what consumerism is all about. That is keeping up with the Joneses. Another thing that's going to start happen is people are going to start documenting what they spend this money on. So not exactly Instagram, but cameras are going to start to become a thing, both photo cameras and home family home video cameras. And where they're gonna start going is going to be further and further afield thanks to the interstate highway system. This is gonna be one of Eisenhower's big projects in the mid 1950s. It was ostensibly there to kind of connect America and also be used, if we ever got invaded by the Russians, we'd be able to use the interstate highway system to quickly move troops across the country. Realistically though, this is just a good way for the country to shrink. If you remember back into the 1830s, 40s, 50s, when we were talking about railroads, this is the same thing but even faster because now every family or most families have a car. You don't need to wait for a railroad anymore. You can take your family and go wherever you want all across the country. This is your original map of the interstate highway system. Hey, it's us. Look at that. Well, it's us. Look at that. Um, but this is going to shrink quote unquote America. Again, it is easier to go places. So vacations, thanks to that disposable income become part of American culture. You are going to take your boat out somewhere and you know do that. You are going to go camping with your family in a national park and you're gonna take pictures and you are going to show those off on your brand new slide projector that you just got from Kodak. And you're gonna show that off to all of your neighbors at your next local party in the suburbs and they're all gonna say, oh look, they went to Glacier, they went to Yosemite, they went to the Grand Canyon. Look at those beautiful pictures and how happy they all are. Next summer, we're going on vacation there. Disneyland is gonna open in 1955 and pull people to it. Disney World will not open until the early 70s, but Disneyland is going to draw people to Los Angeles. Remember we talked about Nikita Khrushchev last week being upset that he didn't get to go to Disneyland when he visited Eisenhower in the 50s. Um, that sort of growing concept I hope you guys are getting of America all wanting to be the same is going to be accelerated thanks to television. Television is going to show off kind of an ideal view of America. I've put two links in here, Leave It to Beaver and Lucy will both take you to YouTube videos. I've put my foot down as earlier on, you know, not showing you videos in YouTube. I feel as though that's redundant, but give those a look. Is the Leave It to Beaver one is like two minutes. I Love Lucy's maybe four, but Leave It to Beaver is the prototypical new baby boomer family. Dad is, you know, upper middle class. Mom is a homemaker. Um, Wally is a teenager who's all interested in going to sock hops with the girls in their poodle skirts. And Beaver is a lovable scamp who runs around the neighborhood and learns important lessons about you know community and responsibility. Um, I Love Lucy is going to see two different comedians raise a family in the city. Um, 
but hey, it's the 1950s. So whenever you see uh, Lucy and Ricky's bedroom, they have separate beds, despite the fact that Lucy is pregnant and Lucy and Ricky were literally married in real life. Um, but all of that is going to show an aspirational American dream. It's going to put that front and center. Americans have TVs now because they bought one, because their neighbors bought one, because their neighbors bought one. And they're all able to see this American dream and say, hey, I want that. I want that specific brand of food that this housewife is going out and getting. I want this Motorola television. Every single one of these things has a logo on it. And that is going to be the American dream. Advertising is going to not just be through magazines and newspapers and the radio anymore. It's going to be through television. It's going to put that right in your face. And so much of that stuff will be sponsored. Product placement is now a thing. People on a TV show might go and eat at McDonald's and talk about how great it is. Hey, guess what? Now I want to go to McDonald's and try out that 15 cent burger. It looks delicious. Also, television is going to really drum up this concept of American family values across, and this is here for a reason, white America. Society is going to homogenize. So the majority in America is going to start to think and act the same way. I mean, we've seen it ever since is, you know, a haircut becomes popular, a certain article of clothing becomes popular, whatever. This is going to be accelerated again by television. Television is also going to drive sports further forward. People still, you know, used to listen to boxing matches and baseball games on the radio, but now you can see that happen. And they can go to those games now thanks to disposable income. So it's not just the people in the cities anymore. Is hey, I can take the day off of work and drive to the game with my kids and go watch it. Um, at the same time, um, sports are going to start desegregating. Jackie Robinson, right here, stealing home plate, um, goes to play for the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947. Three months later, on um, in the other league, so in the American League, um, Larry Doby is going to join the Cleveland Indians and start to desegregate baseball. Football is going to move in fits and starts. There will be African-American players here and there in the 1950s, but it's really going to be early 60s. You're going to see colleges like Syracuse and USC and uh, Michigan State have African-American players that are going to make big impacts um, at the national level, but it won't be really until like late 60s, early 70s that the SEC is going to desegregate. Um, all of this, again, thanks to this concept right here of disposable income. You can go buy name brand stuff and then you can show it off and keep up with the Joneses. Um, also worth pointing out, Dwight Eisenhower, as we will talk about in a little bit, is very popular at this point as the president and he is really going to popularize golf as the thing that middle class and upper class white guys do in their spare time. So that is a lot to take in, but also pretty relatable. On we go. So we did kind of the happy stuff. Now we move on to the more sober side of the 1950s at home. Um, so first of all, we have to wrap up the Truman presidency. Um, Harry Truman is going to win election in 1948. You've likely seen that picture that says Dewey defeats Truman. Um, Dewey did not defeat Truman. Um, he Harry Truman wins a hotly contested but kind of boring election of two relatively boring guys in 1948. Um, Truman's going to win with about 309 electoral votes to the other guys like 189, um, something like that. It's, it's pretty boring. Um, the one thing worth pointing out about the 1948 election is the South tries to run its own candidate in super racist Strom Thurmond, who we will talk about again later and you will talk about again next year in government. Um, so three people run. Harry Truman wins re-election, but... He's a Democrat, and the House and the Senate both go to the Republicans. Um, Truman spends his last term in office pretty focused on international issues. He's got NATO to worry about. He's got to worry about helping start up the UN. He's got the Berlin airlift going on. He's got the Korean War. So Harry Truman is largely focused overseas and isn't going to be much of a domestic president as a result. He's going to try to become one but it's going to fail. And that is this thing called the fair deal, which is one of two big things Harry Truman does domestically. Fair deal is an attempt to fix racial issues in America, um, set hiring quotas, um, help um, African Americans and Hispanic folks um, out economically, and it is going to fail miserably. 
both houses of Congress are going to shoot it down because Truman's a, a Democrat and they're Republicans. They want nothing to do with this. So Harry Truman's attempt at signature domestic legislation is what can only be described as a miserable failure. Um, his kind of one big success on the national level goes against the advice of one of his uh, commanding officers. That would be Dwight Eisenhower, who is in the army, says, no, 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 we don't want to desegregate. And Harry Truman says, yes. He issues Executive Order 9981, which officially requires that the United States Army, Navy, and what will become the Air Force all desegregate. So good for Harry Truman. Harry Truman is going to think about running again in 1952. He decides not to. And instead, Dwight Eisenhower is going to run in 1952 against a dude from Illinois named Adlai Stevenson. And he and his running mate, Richard Nixon, are going to absolutely just swan to victory. Um, there is no issue there. Eisenhower is beloved by the vast majority of Americans. Um, Nixon is a little more of a wild card. He's, I mean, he's boring. He's not like a crazy wild card. It's just he's run into some issues in the past that we don't really have time to get into. Um, he'd been accused of bribery and had refuted that pretty, uh, pretty severely. Um, so Nixon is there and sort of seen as the president in waiting. When Eisenhower's done, it'll be Nixon's time. Um, internationally, we talked, uh, Eisenhower had a fair amount to do last time, right? Is, you know, he ends the Korean War, he's got to do all the stuff with the Russians, he's got to thaw out those relationships with Khrushchev. But at home, Eisenhower is what we would call a peacetime or a caretaker president. He doesn't have a ton to do because the country is doing so well. So the stuff Eisenhower is going to do is he's going to deal with segregation and racism only as necessary. We'll talk about that in the next slide and we'll talk about the ramifications of that next week. Eisenhower is not socially progressive. He's a white guy in his 60s that has lived in Kansas and Texas most of his life. Um, and then in the army, which was segregated. So he is not going to be progressive on um, race issues. He basically is like, yeah, let the states figure it out for themselves. I don't want to get involved with this. The big stuff he's going to do are these two right here. And this middle one is probably the biggest part of his legacy that made him so popular at the time. He's going to expand Social Security. He's going to make it open to more people. Again, funded because that baby boom says that we will have a ton of workers going into the future and they will all be paying into Social Security. Um, he's going to raise taxes, especially on corporations. Um, so the U.S. is taking in more money. And he's also going to cut spending. So his goal here is to reduce some of that national debt that we accrued while fighting World War II and Korea, not to mention all of the federal spending that we had to do to get us out of the Great Depression. Um, and then he's also just going to oversee that massive economic boom. Remember the beginning, 37% growth in the American economy over a decade is insane. It's huge. And Eisenhower is going to oversee that. Um, he goes by the nickname of Ike, by the way. That is why Ike is up there. Um, and then the last thing he's going to do is on his way out in 1960, he's going to give a very good speech, and you'll see some of it next year in government, warning about the military-industrial complex. Eisenhower basically says, yes, we have that NSC memo that says we need to spend 20% of our gross domestic product on military stuff, but you guys need to be careful. We cannot allow the American government and American arms manufacturers to get into bed together economically. Um, you can't let them sort of feed off of each other and let the government say we need more weapons and then buy those weapons from the arms manufacturers and then say here's something shinier, you want to buy this, and the U.S. sinks more and more money into its military technology and then it gets sort of that itch to use that new military technology, right? You buy something new, you want to go use it, and then maybe you get involved in another war and then you need more technology and it becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. And Eisenhower says, you guys have to be careful about this. Keep the military out of political life because it's not supposed to be there. This is coming from a man who was both Supreme Allied Commander in Europe and the president. He knows what he's talking about. Unfortunately, he will be almost completely ignored. The other big thing that's going to happen during both the Truman and the Eisenhower presidency is what's called the Red Scare. This is actually the second Red Scare. The first one happened in the 19-teens. Uh, we talked about it a little bit with the 20s, actually. Um, 
But this is that fear, and we talked about it with spies last week, of a communist infiltration of the American government and of just America in general. The commies are sneaking their spies in here and they're stealing secrets from us and they're eventually going to try to take over America like Red Dawn. No, not really. They're spies, definitely. But they're not trying to take over America. Um, so something called HUAC is going to be founded. And this stands for the House Un-American Activities Committee. I will say that again. House Un-American Activities Committee committee. I will make you know that for the quiz on this chapter. I'm telling you now. So if you do not hear this, that means you did not watch this video, which is part of the assignment. And that is on you, hombre. So it is going to be headed by this gentleman right here. He is a dirtbag and a drunk. Um, he is Senator from Wisconsin, Joseph McCarthy. Joe McCarthy decides that he can make his name by going after dirty, rotten communists. He actually did it for a little while with the help of this guy right here, Richard Nixon. But we talked about that last time. Joe McCarthy is going after spies. He's going after any communist infiltration. If you are a communist or ever were a communist, you are not supposed to be able to work in the American government at all. And he is going to go out of his way to expose any sort of communist influence in any aspect of American life. For example, he goes after alleged communists in Hollywood with the help of then Screen Actors Guild president, Ronald Reagan. That name might sound familiar. I hope it does. Um, and McCarthy is going to basically destroy these people's livelihoods, is drag their names through the mud. Even if they had nothing to do with this, just having your name involved is going to be a problem. McCarthy tries to push this to get himself more power later on. Um, he's going to threaten Truman and even General George Marshall, American hero George Marshall, one of my favorite Americans, George Marshall, with being a communist. Um, Truman and Marshall don't really bite at this, and they're just sort of irritated. He even threatens American hero Dwight Eisenhower. That Dwight Eisenhower, the president at the time. By the way, he's threatening Marshall when Marshall is Secretary of State and then Secretary of Defense. And America's like, mm, maybe you're going a little far here. And Eisenhower again is like, hey, you need to back off. Eventually, what's going to happen here is U.S. Army lawyer Joseph Welch, this guy right here, is going to be going up against um, the HUAC, um, the House on American Activities Committee, on television, because television's there now, and McCarthy's going after an um, army doctor? Um, but a, an army officer who had, like, in his teens once, or in his 20s once, been to a communist meeting, and he's bullying him, and that is sort of what McCarthy is famous for, is just going after these people, just like a pit bull, is just going after him and going after him. And Welch basically says, sir, have you no sense of decency here? And it sort of stops McCarthy in his tracks. And Welch very calmly just kind of destroys Joe McCarthy right there on national television saying, like, don't you have something better to do? Like, what service are you providing to the American people by doing this? You're not being particularly effective at it. And you just seem like a bully and a jerk going after anybody that's less powerful than you. And Joe McCarthy is going to lose his credibility. And um, by, I want to say, like 1955, he's going to die of, um, like, some liver disease, I want to say. Um, and just sort of fade away into nothingness in the Senate before he dies. But um, yay for Joe Welch. Un unheralded American hero. Lastly, we talked about nuclear war and the arms race last time. What does that look like at home? And at home, after America realizes that the Russians are capable of making nuclear weapons, of making hydrogen bombs just like we are, there becomes a fear that we could be destroyed by the Russians or they could destroy us. Eventually, it becomes this idea called mutually assured destruction, which, you know, you spell it out, it goes M-A-D, mad. And there is this constant fear that if we attack the Russians, the Russians will destroy us. If the Russians attempt to destroy us, we'll destroy them. Remember that massive retaliation we talked about last time with Eisenhower and uh, John Foster Dulles. So what do Americans do to deal with this? And the answer is, we got this turtle right here. Um, he is going to become the spokesperson for Duck and Cover. This video is 10 minutes long. Don't watch the whole thing, but watch the first like two minutes of it. And it's this idea of, well, if you see a bright flash in the sky, you should get under your desk and cover your head so anything falling on you, you know, won't, won't hurt you. To say nothing of radiation poisoning. But this is sort of the way America deals with this. 
is this sort of fear and making a gesture towards being able to have control over that fear by ducking and covering, while still that gesture is clearly, as we've you know demonstrated over the last week or two, um, talking about nuclear weapons, completely meaningless. But this is sort of what America is going to go through in the 1950s and 1960s is this dual track of on one side you have American exceptionalism and look at all this amazing stuff that we can do. And on the other hand, you have this absolute crippling fear that we could be destroyed at any moment. How do we reconcile that? And the answer kind of tends to be you spend a heck of a lot of money and you try not to think about it. All right, last one. We are going to start on civil rights this week. Your big project next week will be on civil rights, and we will kind of wrap up the civil rights movement, as it were, next week. But let's get started. So, as we discussed at the beginning of this, um, as African Americans move towards urban areas and out of the Deep South, their populations will be concentrated, and it will become more and more clear as they talk with each other and kind of observe what life is like, that they are getting the short end of the stick with regards to the American dream. They are not treated the same way. You have segregation all over the place. Whites only lunch counters, um, different you know, swimming pools, different water fountains, any of that stuff. Um, that is all in the South and you have it more sort of insidious with stuff like restrictive covenants in the North, where the North wants to seem like they're more enlightened, but they're, well, pretty dang close to being just as racist as the South. Um, this is made all the worse by the fact that communist propaganda, and it's not really propaganda because, you know, it's true, is um, under communism, there's a lot more equality. On the other hand, it's worth pointing out that under communism, most people have a similar ethnic background. And so, you know, African Americans that go to communist Russia are treated very well if for no other reason than it's a giant PR coup for the Russians to show African Americans, hey, you're treated better here in communist Russia than you are in capitalist America. So, a couple big events. The first one is the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Um, this is the guys that tried in front of the Supreme Court celebrating. This is future Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall right there. Um, Brown versus Board of Education is a successful argument in front of the Supreme Court, which is now headed um, by a guy named Earl Warren. Earl Warren was appointed by Dwight Eisenhower, and Eisenhower claims that appointing Dwight I or appointing Earl Warren to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was the worst decision he ever made, because Earl Warren was the governor of California who called for Executive Order 9066 to happen, which, as you will recall, was the internment of all the Japanese. Um, he was a very conservative governor for a long time, and Eisenhower's like, awesome, it'll be, he'll be a conservative justice on the court. And instead, Earl Warren goes on to be the probably the second most influential chief justice in American history behind John Marshall and one of the most liberal justices of all times and really goes on to expand people's rights and fight against any form of discrimination. Eisenhower was not super into that. So... Um, What's going to happen here is Brown versus Board of Education is going to successfully argue that the Plessy versus Ferguson separate but equal ruling that says African Americans can get different stuff than white people and be forced to take it as long as it is quote unquote equal. Um, Brown versus Board is going to show that, hey, that's not the case. They're even going to use some what is now considered um, legally dubious uh, statistics that basically show that um, children that go to segregated schools um, African-American children have a lower sense of self-worth than um, white kids that go to schools in similar areas. So even though they're separate, they're inherently unequal. Therefore, it's a violation of the 14th Amendment, and therefore it is unconstitutional. So the Warren Court is going to rule unanimously. So this is a 9-0 ruling that school segregation needs to be ended with, quote, all deliberate speed. This is going to cause problem in the future because southern states are going to drag their heels and claim that they're acting with all deliberate speed when they are clearly not. So segregation is inherently unequal. At the same time, you are going to see a massive rise in the KKK in the South and in Indiana. Um, and 101 members of Congress are going to condemn the ruling of Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and 
America is going to move forward slowly but surely through a series of more Supreme Court decisions to pick away at segregation and try to get African Americans back on a level, level playing field like Harry Truman had tried to do with the fair deal a couple years earlier. So next thing that's going to happen the next year is the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, Rosa Parks is arrested. She knows she will be arrested for doing this. Um, she, she makes the conscious decision to do that. Rosa Parks before this had worked for the NAACP and um, had gone around documenting a great danger to her own life. Um, sexual assaults that happened against African-American women in the South perpetrated by white men is Rosa Parks is there from the get go and is an incredibly strong lady to do so. Um, she's arrested. And soon afterwards, Martin Luther King is going to enter here um, from Montgomery as well and start a bus boycott. So that's what you see here is these are African-Americans that are walking, you know, 8, 10, 13 miles a day both ways to work to not give money to the city of Montgomery's buses until they desegregate, which causes massive economic damage to the city of Montgomery. And um, eventually it's going to be the Supreme Court is going to, in another decision, declare that all segregation is unconstitutional, period, full stop. There is no arguing over this. But Brown versus Board of Education, Montgomery bus boycott are going to be the first things that are really going to just brutally hammer home how poorly African Americans are being treated and how the Supreme Court is going to step up and start chipping away bit by bit at segregation. There are a ton of cases involving segregation. We're not going to get into all of them now. We are now going to get into another story where we talked earlier about how Eisenhower really only dealt with this as necessary. That's because um, he was not a big fan of desegregation, but he realized that his role as the chief executive is the person that enforces the laws for the country needed to make a decision. So Brown versus Board of Education finally getting enforced in Alabama, I'm sorry, in Arkansas in 1957 at Little Rock High School. Um, nine African-American students were going to go to Little Rock High School. And the governor of the state, a gentleman with the comically evil name of Orville Faubus, O-R-V-I-L-L-E-F-A-U-B-U-S, um, says, nope, you are not going here. And he calls out uh, state troopers and he's like, nope, you can't let these kids into the school. I will not have African-Americans going to my white high school. Um, you can see this is a bunch of horrible white girls all yelling at this African-American young lady going to school. There are interviews with them decades later. They're still horrible white ladies. Um, very bless your heart, Southern white ladies, but still just gigantic racists. But if we look closer in this, you will see a helmeted individual wearing a military uniform. That is because Dwight Eisenhower does not want to deal with Orville Faubus. Dwight is on vacation at Camp David, which is the presidential retreat in, I believe it is Maryland. It is named after his son, actually, David Eisenhower, who will go on to marry one of Richard Nixon's daughters later on. Fun fact. Um, anyway, Eisenhower is going to get a heads up from his attorney general and says, hey, they're not, uh, they're not desegregating Little Rock High School. And we might look at this later on in the year, actually. There are a series of telegrams that go back and forth between Eisenhower and Faubus where Eisenhower says, hey, Supreme Court says you have to do this. Stop messing around and do it. And Faubus keeps sending back these very kind of whiny, um, I would describe them as pissy letters back to um, President Eisenhower saying, yeah, I don't have to do this. I don't want to. And Eisenhower gets fed up with it and says, look, I don't think you get what I'm saying here. You are being ordered by the President of the United States enforcing a Supreme Court ruling that you have to desegregate these schools. And Faubus says no. And Eisenhower says, you know what? Fine. I'm done dealing with this. I'm going to send in my airborne veterans from World War II with 50 caliber machine guns on the back of Jeeps to escort these nine young people to go to high school. And so at gunpoint, Little Rock High School is integrated. About a month later, um, Faubus is going to shut down the school altogether to do this, and it will remain closed for a while. But Dwight Eisenhower basically steps up and says, look, personal beliefs don't matter when you're the president. You are there to enforce the will of the American people, be that through enforcing roles in Congress or by enforcing the decisions of the Supreme Court as to constitutionality. So Eisenhower says, I might not love this, but what I like doesn't matter. The Constitution says this is my job, and I will do it. Um, 
This, I think, is the seminal moment of the Eisenhower presidency and shows why he is still regarded as such a great president, is he takes personal feelings out of it and does what is right for the country. Um, integration is going to remain a major issue for well over a decade, and that's why I said we're going to deal with it more next week. Um, so next week will be another home front lecture. Um, Eisenhower is going to pass two laws, one in 1957 and one in 1960. He's going to do these um, because the uh, Senate Majority Leader, a gentleman by the name of Lyndon Johnson, who we will talk about later, um, has pushed these pieces of legislation through Congress. And they're going to set up a permanent Civil Rights Commission and um, make sure that the Justice Department has expanded civil rights investigation and protection powers. So what this means is now the federal government says, hey, states, if you don't enforce civil rights laws or ensure that everybody is being treated equally under the Constitution, now the federal government can come in and try people for crimes that you decided to skip over. Um, there's some very violent crimes that happened in the 1950s that I'm holding on to for what you guys are going to work on next week. But um, suffice it to say, there are some despicable hate crimes that happened in the 1950s that... Johnson and Eisenhower are both looking at and saying, well, we can't allow this to stand. This hurts America's credibility, and also it's inhuman. Two groups are going to pop up in this time that are not run by the government that are going to do a lot to push for um, the tearing down of racial walls in the South. The first one is the SCLC. This is the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It's going to be led by Martin Luther King, who we were introduced to up here, and hopefully you know already. But um, their job is this is going to be a bunch of church leaders, African-American church leaders largely. Um, there will be white church leaders. There will be um, rabbis involved with this as well. Um, but throughout the South, and what they do is they organize protests and they set up policy. So when a protest is going to happen, we're all going to protest the same way. So when a sit-in happens or when a boycott of, you know, Montgomery or any of the other cities in the South that get boycotts, that there is a rule of thumb for how everything is going to be run. So there's no question as to what the goals are or what steps are willing to be taken. So this sets up kind of a uniform protest movement across the South for African-Americans and people working with African-Americans to get them their constitutionally guaranteed rights. The other one is what is called SNCC, the SNCCs, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And they're going to be sort of the, um, I mean, you would almost think of them as like the Bernie bros people are now, is a little more radical, um, a little more willing to make unpleasant decisions for better outcomes later on. They're gonna organize sit-ins, they will go to protests, they will stand up to fire hoses and police dogs. They are going to become one of the sort of activist front lines for the civil rights movement and will take an even larger role um, after the Eisenhower presidency when um, the Kennedys come in, promise a lot, and then don't do a whole heck of a lot. But we will talk about that stuff later. So this is where we're going to end, is the um, civil rights movement is making a lot of progress here. Um, Brown versus Board, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott, um, civil rights laws in 57 and 60, desegregating Little Rock High School. Um, African Americans and the federal government are starting to realize that they can work together to get something accomplished here. And we're going to see that culminate um, in the Johnson presidency next week when Lyndon Johnson is able to, there's no nice way to put this, exploit the death of John F. Kennedy to get a whole bunch of civil rights legislation passed. Um, and then he's going to keep building on that. So this week, we have gone through a fair amount of stuff. Um, we've talked about the baby boom, the rise of the suburbs, and how business in America gets better for most people. We talked about consumerism, what people were buying, why they were buying it, keeping up with the Joneses. We talk about how American sports are going to become a bigger thing, how the country is going to shrink again thanks to the interstate highway system. Uh, we talked about American culture under television. We talked about fear of communism. We talked about the boom period of the Eisenhower presidency and sort of the failures of the end of the Truman presidency. And then we talked about the beginning of the civil rights movement in earnest. And next week, we will get into what happens next. What does American culture 
and uh, domestic government look like in the 1960s. So have fun. Good luck with your quiz. And I'll talk with you later. Bye.